Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I am uh, Veronica Howard. I'm a faculty member in the University of Alaska Anchorage Psychology Department. Uh, but one of my favorite hats to wear is actually as a co-chair of UAA's Textbook Affordability Committee. And I get to work very closely with one of my favorite colleagues in the whole world, DRC Hutchings. I'm going to turn it over for that introduction. Hey there. Yes, I'm DRC Hutchings. I am an associate professor of library science. My <clears throat> more informal title is instructional design librarian and also sort of a de facto OER librarian. And so happy to be partnered with uh, Veronica Howard on our UAA textbook portability initiative. All right. And I'm getting a notice here that our screen may not be fully shared. Uh, let me know a little bit more about what you mean there so that I can try to fix it. What we're going to be doing today is uh, talking a little bit about how to try to build up a program, how to uh, facilitate uh, faculty support, faculty involvement uh, at a time when our resources may not uh, really uh, drap. Um, unfortunately, what I'm hearing is that the, the screen share has started, but folks can't see it, which is a small challenge that I've been having lately. I'm going to try it one more time, but what may happen is I may have to uh, step out and come back in order to get folks to see my screen. Thumbs now, yes, no? All right, give me just a moment. I'm going to step away and then come back in just a moment. Uh, alternatively, Professor Hutchings, if you were able to sh do the screen share, we might be able to move along uh, differently. What uh, we're, we're trying to do here just is to talk about the ways in which you can build up a program uh, to facilitate faculty adoption of open educational resources at a time when your resources may not be the most robust. Uh, what I'm going to do here is, um, sorry, I'm going to step away for just a moment and come right back. And so what we find under these kinds of circumstances is that sometimes you just got to be flexible. So I'm going to check one more time just to see if things are oh, blessed technology, right? It makes fools of everyone, myself especially. So we're talking about building a robust program to the extent that we're able to when our resources are limited. Now, there is a, a small amount, perhaps, of, of irony or even perhaps hypocrisy here when I say our resources are limited. We are very, very grateful, DRC and I, to have the support of some grant funding. We were fortunate enough to receive uh, the USDA's uh, NIFA, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian uh, Student Serving Grant. And this is designed to help promote and encourage students from uh, diverse populations, particularly Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian students, uh, to come into agricultural sciences, into natural sciences. And so we're making the best use we can of these grant dollars to help support faculty in making this transition to open or free to access resources. We also couldn't possibly do this kind of work without a lot of really wonderful colleagues and peers and mentors. So we want to do a quick shout out here to folks like Matthew, Matthew Bloom and Jeffrey Gallant. Uh, who have given us resources and support. Kaylin Nagel, who's got some really wonderful advice we want to share with you. Uh, other researchers and uh, practitioners like Verena Roberts, Amy Nussbaum, Virginia Clinton, John Hilton, and so many others. And these are folks in our open community. We also have colleagues here at our university, like our Mist Musketeer, Heather Nice, who was one of our earliest partners in this work, our Vice Provost for Student Success, Claudia Lampman, our Dean of the College, Steve Rollins, Dave Dannenberg, who was our close colleague, Heather Nash, Catherine Schild, uh, Zoe Dietz, and so, so many more people. So I imagine that you're probably here because the uh, title is enticing, right? So you want to open and uh, create an open initiative. Well, the best places that you can go for advice on how to do that and how to be effective to do that are places where it's already been demonstrated to be efficacious. So you might be checking out programs like BC Campus, who has a long and established uh, career of making resources open, or statewide initiatives like Open Oregon. 
right? The amazing work that's being done by Amy Hoffer and colleagues there. You might look at, I mentioned Jeff Gallant, who's a, an amazing colleague. You might look at Affordable Learning Georgia, another statewide initiative really promoting uh, open adoption and creation in the state of Georgia. Or you might check out our colleagues who are doing things like Maricopa Millions. It's a smaller geographical area, but they're working together in kind of a consortium model to promote this adoption to support faculty in making this transition. Now, one thing that you're going to discover that all of these have in common, or that presentations on how to build a robust program have in common, is that not only are they led by amazing researchers, amazing people, people who are strong and passionate about the work that they're doing, but they also have resources, right? They have the resources for people to do the work, and they also have the resources for people to come to conferences like these to present the work. And when DRC and I first started doing this work, we're coming from the University of Alaska Anchorage. We're coming from an institution that uh, when I joined it in 2013 was beginning to lose resources or our enrollment was declining. Our budget was certainly being slashed. Now this is a, an open enrollment institution Right In the state of Alaska, we have no community colleges. So we serve everyone from the student who might otherwise go and complete their AA degree at a smaller cost-effective community college to folks who wanna pursue advanced training, uh, PhDs, postdocs. We also uh, live and work on the land of the Denina El Nena, unceded uh, ancestral land. And we have that obligation to be supporting students in the best way possible. We have a small university and we have very limited resources. And that's where our story begins. So Veronica and I met at the 12th annual Open Education Conference in November 2015 in Vancouver, BC. We had both taken up an offer from the faculty development director on our campus for a funded trip to the conference in exchange for just a small time commitment over the course of one year. Uh, we only had to go and learn, then come back to discuss whether and how we could bring OER to our university. I think I can speak for them when I say that the conference ignited a fire in us. I mean, here we are six years later presenting to you. Uh, we really took the ball and ran with it, building our initiative from the ground up. Thus, our initiative has modest origins. It was very much a grassroots effort led by three of us in what really was our spare time, if that's a thing. Uh, Veronica and I, plus a third person, Heather Nice, who made that faithful trip to Vancouver with us. And she was an ins instructional designer from the faculty development department who sadly left our team in the university a few years ago. So the work wasn't officially in any of our workloads and our group had no official home within the institution. We didn't belong to any department or committee or exist in the official governance structure. Uh, advance the slide, please. Our initial strategy was to partner with groups on campus who were already doing closely related work. For example, we'd piggyback on other trainings to spend just a few minutes highlighting OER or we'd ask if we could do an entire OER session when an organization was planning a multi-session professional development event. And perhaps even more importantly, we would speak to anyone who would listen and to many who wouldn't. Uh, in all the meetings and conversations we were part of by nature of our real jobs, if there was anything even tangentially related to textbook affordability, we'd be right there bringing it up. There's actually an ongoing joke that Veronica, in particular, is the OER Kool-Aid person. Any mention of the word open or OER or any kind of affordability or textbooks or diversity or equity inclusion or student success in any context and Veronica virtually bursts through the wall to tell you about textbook affordability. Oh yeah. Now, over time, we began collecting data however we could with Veronica taking the lead on conducting research with our local students and faculty. We also worked uh, to get bookstore data, though that what they provided initially was very limited until about fall of 2019, when we moved to an online bookstore company. And before long, we began aggressively pursuing funding, applying for every institutional 
grant that we could make an argument for and a couple national grants as well. The way that we had planned to develop this initiative was really uh, born out of my history doing work in organizations as well as my background uh, at the University of Kansas. So uh, what we typically do when we're talking about developing a kind of grassroots community endeavor is we might use something like the stages of community readiness. Uh, and this is like a nine step structure where you're looking at the role of the organization or you're looking at the initiative within a context of a complex structure or organism like a community. Uh, we go from stages like no awareness, nobody's talking about it, doesn't really seem to be an issue for anyone, through things like when you start bringing it up, initially you get denial or resistance. Then uh, when you're there long enough, delivering the message long enough, people start paying attention. They have vague awareness, or maybe we start moving into something called pre-planning, where uh, the folks who make the decisions recognize that something has to be done, and they're beginning an initiative. Now, this is just a model. It's one that has a lot of benefits in terms of giving us a, a structure uh, of what to expect, uh, but it's also built on some assumptions. I'm going to talk about those in a moment. Uh, if you want to learn more, we do have additional resources, so I'm just going to pop those into chat just one more time in case anyone wants to have a look at some of those, uh, in particular the, the work of uh, Plested and colleagues or the work on uh, uh, implementation science could be really beneficial to review. Now, when we're talking about making this change within an established institution, typically we're looking at five different structures or five different major components that we're looking for. Things like knowledge. Uh, is the community aware that there's even a problem to be addressed or an opportunity to be capitalized on? What's the current climate? of the institution, not like geographically or in terms of weather, but like, what do people think about? How, what's their attitude towards the initiative that you're trying to do? In this case, textbook affordability. Uh, you look at what's currently being done. What are the current efforts that are being uh, achieved or, or try to tackle the same issue? Looking at things also like resources and leadership. And those two things are, of course, very, very important for making any kind of change because they, they really can uh, contribute greatly to how much time, how much effort, and what you have to do to really shift the needle. So we were, in those initial stages, beginning to assess things like awareness of OERZTC. We've done some surveys. We've tracked some data. We get some information from students and faculty and you know see what the issue is. And we're moving along at a modest but brisk pace, right? We're getting small pools of money to do this work. And then life happens. In this case, in 2018, uh, Alaska experienced the second largest earthquake that has ever been on record. Uh, in November of 2018, uh, it was catastrophic for many. You know, the state shut down. M most of our infrastructure was heavily damaged. But Alaskans are really robust, right? We, we pull together. We help one another. Uh, this is certainly not the first, the last, or the only time that we've experienced disaster. So this little thing is not going to get us down. Perhaps a less charitable person might say that that wasn't even the worst thing that happened that week. So uh, in 2018, we also had a new governor installed in our state, and the governor ran on a platform of uh, really promoting uh, a pool of money to come back to citizens. In Alaska, we have something called the Permanent Fund Dividend, and it's a, a yearly uh, annual payout from the dividends from oil reserve funds. Uh, and many Alaskans, especially those uh, in remote areas, locations, really rely on those funds. Low-income Alaskans really struggle as well. So the primary focus of this platform was, let's get you more PFD money. And uh, Governor Dunleavy was installed in 2018. And just a few months later in their annual budget, they cut $134 million from the University of Alaska system. And that doesn't probably seem like very much for larger institutions, but for the University of Alaska, it was 41% of our combined budget for the state. 
And it put us in some really tough spots. The uh, Board of Regents went on to later declare exigency. So in summer of 2019, the university was entering exigency. There was talk of discontinuing many programs, of uh, letting many faculty go, and it created some challenges. It also created many changes. Now remember this occurred in summer of 2019, and what you can see is the impact that some of these uh, situations have had on on our organization. What I'm giving you here is just a Gantt chart showing you who's here. In the time that we've been working on this in earnest, we've had four different chancellors. We've had three different provosts. In fact, at one point, I believe our chancellor was our provost at the same time. Some of the directors are major partners for our initiative, uh, like the faculty development director, the multicultural center director, the native student services director. Uh, those folks left their post, they, they went to other universities. And it took uh, a number of years, two and a half years, for us to install a chief diversity officer, even after the position was formally created in 2017. So it's really uh, created kind of a challenge. And I'd love to be able to tell you about the leadership closer to actual faculty like the deans of each of our colleges. Uh, unfortunately, I'm a psychologist and not a mathematician. So uh, finding records, first of all, archivally was difficult. And then tracking those over time was even more difficult. This is at the same time that we're also losing many of our uh, peers. So in the period under review here, we've lost 28% of our faculty and 46% of our staff. Our one saving grace has been uh, our Vice Provost for Student Success, who has been our rock, who has been our, our champion, uh, and she has declared that she's retiring at the end of this year. So, this is the backdrop of where we find ourselves. Things were real bad. But then we got a federal grant for nearly half a million dollars. So some ray of sunshine in the darkness. <laughs> so remember, um, uh, so remember how I said earlier that we applied to every grant that we could make an argument for or that you should do that? Well, our current grant is from the USDA, National Institute of Food and Agriculture for a program focused on helping Alaska Native serving institutions address educational needs within what they call a broadly defined arena of food and agricultural sciences related disciplines. So we argued in our proposal that OER, especially in lower division general education courses, improves retention and graduation rates for all majors, including within the food and agricultural sciences. Our grant funded program is officially called the Alaska Open Education Initiative, and it focuses on four key elements. Faculty, so we promote adoption of OER and zero cost course materials through faculty development and supports. Our specific efforts there include our textbook affordability fellows, a, uh, an OER slash ZTC certificate program, miscellaneous workshops, and one-on-one -on -one support. And we'll talk about some of those in later slides to come. Students. Our textbook affordability student ambassador program, or TASA, uh, that begins actually later this week. And it empowers students to advocate for themselves within the context of textbook affordability and beyond. Moving to the lower left, partnerships. We are forging, reforging, thanks to all that turnover, and strengthening key partnerships to leverage resources and further culture change at our institution. And impact data. We are collecting information on adoptions, such as who our adopters are and the number of students they reach, cost savings, adoption sufficiency, impact of OER or ZTC on student performance, and more. Now, the central pillar of our faculty programming uh, is our textbook affordability fellows program. This is a year long faculty professional development and support program designed to encourage and facilitate the transition of courses from commercial course materials to zero cost course materials. In order to complete the program and receive their $2,500 award, 
faculty need to complete a number of deliverables. And you can actually find a checklist of our deliverables among our other session resources uh, in the, the, the linked materials in the chat and also using this QR code on this slide. So first, they participate in a week-long training, uh, an intensive training rather, in May, scheduled for the week after faculty contracts end and before summer semester begins. We structured our intensive similarly to what was a long running program at our university called the Technology Fellows Program, which teaches course design along with a theme related to using technology and teaching. So our version of the fellows is heavy on textbook affordability and related topics with some strong elements of course design training. Our fellows program is thoughtfully designed according to instructional design principles while also teaching faculty how to do better instructional design themselves. We considered what skills faculty need to effectively do the work of switching to ZTC materials and use that to, develop, to develop our outcomes. Then we applied backward design to develop how we would assess those outcomes, then which activities and content faculty would need, uh, need to work through in order to be successful. We were careful to keep the training relevant and place specific. And lastly, we have embraced an iterative process, collecting feedback and improving the program from year to year. By modeling effective instructional design and explicitly teaching the fellows to improve their own instructional design, we maximize success within the courses that have moved to ZTC. For those of you who are interested in seeing our curriculum, it will be available for public use within about a year and it will be openly licensed. Now returning to those program requirements, in addition to the intensive, faculty must of course transition at least one course to zero textbook cost and commit to sticking to it for at least two semesters. From our experience, nearly everyone who sticks with ZTC materials for two semesters continues on doing so after that. Why is it two semesters? Well, if the first semester ends up being a bit rough, they're at least committed to improving the course for one other round, which again, improves the longevity. Next, we require the fellows to give back that is to share their experience transitioning to ZTC materials with our university community. We allow a great deal of flexibility so faculty can find a way to do this in a way that works for them. And our reasoning for doing this is twofold. Uh, givebacks build awareness of our local initiative. This is important since research like Spillaboy et al. Uh, found that faculty who are aware of an OER initiative are more likely to adopt OER themselves. Also. Research, like uh, Lane et al, has shown that faculty are more likely to try a new pedagogical strategy if a trusted peer is also using it. Another key requirement for them is to share their data with us. Now, this isn't currently a requirement for the fellows to collect particular data in a particular way. Rather, we ask that if they do collect any data within their course, and we encourage them to do so, related to the use of ZTC materials that they then share that data with us. Now, in order to help our faculty meet the requirements, we provide ongoing support beyond the week-long intensive. We ask that they meet with me as the instructional design and OER librarian at least once during the program year at a time that they find most useful. For some, that will be some hands-on help, scrounging up hard to find OER and ZTC materials that meet their needs. Others will get assistance navigating Creative Commons licenses while remixing a work or brainstorming ideas for an open pedagogy assignment or some other need related to their adoption of ZTC materials. In our required monthly meetings throughout the year, we keep track of their progress, fellows inspire each other or commiserate, and we provide additional timely trainings based on their needs. We also send out weekly emails that are a mix of reminders, inspiring messages, summaries of neat resources that we've found, and announcements about uh, upcoming webinars and opportunities we may have come across. Our fellows have told us that together with the regular meetings, the emails serve as effective regular reminders that they need to keep working on their adoptions and courses, in addition to providing them with helpful content. Now let's talk outcomes. We've closely tracked our fellows and the impact of this program. Looking at our first two cohorts, there are 20 faculty members who have taught 238 zero cost uh, 
zero textbook cost sections from fall of 2019 through spring of 2021. Again, 20 faculty members teaching 238 sections. Now this has saved about 5,241 students, nearly $500,000 in estimated textbook costs. Now, again, we're only talking about our fellows here. This is not other adopters that we have reached through other means uh, through our programming. And our third cohort of the textbook affordability fellows is nearly halfway through the program now, and we anticipate all 12 participants to complete. Well, and, and I think that the thing that is really valuable there is not only are the faculty changing the courses that we contracted them to change, we're supporting them to make a change in a specific course for two semesters, but we're starting to discover that their open transition is proliferating to other non-target courses, plus many of them are serving as advocates and evangelists to others in their department, really speaking back to that Lane uh, article about how when you trust someone, when you work closely with them, you're willing to try something different different. Now, all of this is an, on a very basic level embedded within the science, right? So as uh, we mentioned in the beginning, I'm, I'm a psychology professor, but my background is really in something called organizational behavior management. In this particular case, what, what we're looking at uh, is I, I look at the world, I look at everything that we do within this kind of three lens structure. So this is a, a reference or a, a figure taken from a wonderful systems analysis article by Diener and colleagues. And really what I'm looking at here is not only how does the individual performer fit within their context, not only are we collecting data or performance information about the, the individual worker, but we're also seeing how groups uh, on a process level are achieving outcomes. And then how does the organization as a whole embed within the culture and the environment and the community that they serve? And as DRC and I are working, we're always, you know, even though we're focusing here on the performer level, even though we're focusing on the behavior of our faculty, our faculty adopters, et cetera, we're really thinking about that larger structure and the way in which we can help embed and insulate this program within the organization. We've also taken a sort of three-term contingency approach here when we're looking at the, the behavior of faculty, right? You often hear faculty just won't adopt, faculty just won't make that switch. Well, why not, right? And when we look at it from that kind of behavior analytic or uh, operant conditioning paradigm, when you're trying to explain behavior, whether it be adopting OER's ETC or uh, voting in favor and helping to support us make this institutional change, well, typically we look at that behavior in context. We look at the consequences that the behavior produces. Uh, are the faculty compensated for their work? Are they recognized for making that transition? Are they connecting with and seeing the results like improved student learning? Are they impacted beneficially by improved student retention? Are they seeing that their work impacts the organization? Right? And we also look at the way in which the culture, the context surrounds that behavior. So if faculty aren't adopting, do they have enough time? Have they had sufficient training? Do they have competing task demands, like other stuff they have to be doing? Are they finding sufficient resources? In some fields, like mine, there's just not enough available OER uh, for someone to adopt, so they'd really have to create it in order to use it. Are there enough support staff, right? DRC is mentioning that she does a lot of support for our fellows because she's an instructional design librarian. Are there librarians? Are there instructional designers? Is there uh, a, a method by which folks can do this adoption and this transformation? And is there a need, right? Going back to culture, is there a need? Does anyone even know that this exists? And it's within these two areas, context and consequences, where we focus most of our efforts, right? If we want to shift adoption, we need to really be highlighting some of the things here from the context. We need to make sure first that people know it's happening. We need to see that they're seeing others do it, that, that it's a path that they can achieve. Uh, we need to make it easier to share resources. If we come across, DRC and I, uh, something that could be potentially effective for someone who's not currently in our fellowship program, we'll send it out to them and say, hey, have you seen this really awesome open resource in your field that could speak to your course? And then the next time uh, the, the fellowship becomes available, those folks are more likely to come and join us or to at least apply to be part of the program. 
We also, as we mentioned before, we're starting up our textbook affordability student ambassador program or TASA program. And so what we're doing here is actually supporting students to self-advocate, to talk to faculty, to share their stories of how the cost of course materials impacts their education and impacts their trajectory through college. And then we're also developing an easier access, an easier route into OER adoption. We're, we're creating self-paced resources and a self-paced training certificate. So maybe a person can't commit their full summer, but they can certainly go in and self-train uh, through some material that could be relevant to them. We also work very, very hard to shift the culture so that there are consequences, favorable outcomes for folks who make this transition. So right now we're working hard with university leaders to promote OER and ZTC adoption in our uh, Associates of Arts courses, the courses that get students a two-year degree, doing that by making time available and increasing recognition. We're doing things like uh, working to embed OER and ZTC explicitly in faculty's promotion and tenure guidelines. This is consistent with some work that's done by the Doers Group. You can find a link in our resources and was initially uh, presented on by folks at universities like Pittsburgh State. Uh, really effective because if, if OER is a high impact uh, teaching strategy to support diverse students, if it's not in the PNT guidelines, folks who aren't familiar may not uh, identify that and reward that behavior. We're also really encouraging faculty to collect data on their students' performance, their students' feedback and satisfaction, so that they can really be connecting with that possible reinforcer of helping their students and seeing the impact that it makes in their lives. And then finally, we're working really, really hard to refine our data collection methods. Uh, as DRC mentioned earlier, the data that we have available on who's using open is multiply problematic at our institution, simply because we don't yet have course marking. We don't yet have a course system that faculty are using consistently to indicate that their materials are free to access. So we can't even begin to honor and identify folks who are using open if, if we don't know who's actually doing it. So refined data collection at an institutional level is something that we're definitely working on, which then helps to contribute. Uh, it fosters the institutionalization of this intervention. Now, this is just an overview, a highlight of our program and all the work that we're doing to try to instill it within the organization and protect it from a lot of the stuff that we shared with you at the beginning. What I wanna do is just move very quickly through some practical advice. I mean, when you have an intervention like this that's not part of the institution that requires people to stand up and to demand it, to, to move that needle, you gotta find a champion. And there's a lot of really wonderful research about who are uh, your champions, who's going to be the person who can operate on a really lean schedule of reinforcement. Uh, you're looking for people with certain personality characteristics. So maybe someone who has self-confidence, who's persistent, who's energetic and risk prone. Let me clarify, when I say risk prone, what I mean is someone who's not sensitive to extinction for their behavior not being rewarded or someone who's not sensitive to maybe being punished a little bit for speaking up for the cause. You want someone who's gonna speak truth to power and take a risk. We also see that in leadership behavior, someone who has strong vision for change, someone who pursues unconventional means, someone who helps develop and lift up other people and their potential, and then finally giving recognition to those around them. Uh, you also look for someone who's got maybe a lot of experience, someone who's maybe in middle management, who knows lots of different people, someone who has some decision to making authority, uh, in-depth knowledge of their organization, and who has some diverse experiences that they can pull on to make this work. Uh, now you can have multiple champions, but these are the kinds of qualities that you're looking for in someone who's going to stand up and do that work. We also have some additional advice and I'm gonna turn it over to DRC here to, to continue to tell us what you can do to do this. So first off, find your people, sort of related to your champions there, but even if you're lucky enough to have a partner in crime like I do in Veronica, you are going to need other allies. Who can help you write grants? Who's on board with your goals and is willing to speak up in the meetings that they're in that you aren't? Which adopters do you have who'd be willing to present their work to other faculty? Also look for faculty who share your values and beliefs and target them for making the switch for OER or ZTC. Kayla Nagel, formerly of US PERG, gave us some advice that really stuck with us. 
it's not your job to change people's minds. It's your job to find the people who already believe the way you do and join together to do the hard work. We encourage you to embrace that advice as well because it's really helped us prioritize where we're going to put our very limited resources. Next, be flexible. Think creatively about funding opportunities. You might have the best luck with things that seem only tangentially related to OER where you can come up with a strong argument for their connection. Remember, we didn't get an OER grant. We got a narrowly focused student success grant that advances our entire OER program. We got a narrow, um, excuse me, we are using OER to meet the goals of the funding agency. Similarly, uh, you need to be flexible when promoting OER and CTC on campus. How can access to resources, promoting student success, raising diverse voices, et cetera, all that wonderful benefit of and potential for OER tie together with emerging initiatives on your campus, such as those seeking to increase student enrollment, promote DEI, encourage retention, et cetera. So look for synergy. Also get data. Data is the language of most administrators and it's going to be the foundation of what faculty adopters are looking to see. Remember that all data are valuable, quantitative and qualitative, and brainstorm helpful data points and work to get it from whoever might have it. Expect that people will ask you for data often, including administrators who need it by the end of the day today, because there might be this exciting opportunity, but I have to have it today. And then just for the sake of time, I'm going to hop in here. Just a, a couple more things. Uh, speaking very loosely, you got to find reinforcers. Like we said, this is this is a tough gig. You have to find your reinforcers as well as those of others. The people who can contribute to this probably aren't going to be adequately compensated. So if you can find someone who needs grant writing, who needs to do some research, maybe for promotion and tenure, uh, for someone who can be motivated by the things that you can offer, because it's very likely not money, get those on your team. And bear in mind that most OER ZTC pioneers probably aren't going to be compensated. You can also join together to help other people meet their goals when you have mutually beneficial relationships, right? So we work with, for instance, Native Student Services to help them support and retain their students. And we're also interested in promoting and retaining success for Alaska Native students as well. Uh, we also make sure that we're, we're very careful to never ask someone to make this change without benefit. If we can't help them highlight something that's going to reward them, is, is it in their PT file? Is it somewhere? else. Finally, uh, you know, be honest. This takes a lot of work. Transformation takes a lot of work no matter where you cut it. And many faculty are losing out on the deal when they're switching from OER to ETC. We're also very careful to always advocate for the voice that's not in the room. If we're meeting with faculty, we talk about the benefit for students. If we're meeting with students, we talk about some of the challenges that faculty have, etc. Last, remember, be patient. You know, progress isn't always linear. Uh, and it, you're going to have a lot of setbacks, and you have to be tenacious. Uh, DRC wasn't kidding when very often this face is the face that fe people think of when they think of Open Educational Resources or CDC. Don't give up. Be that person on your campus. I want to reserve some time for questions, but thank you. Thank you so much. So we did have a question uh, from Elizabeth. Uh, could you share your methods and findings for getting data from the bookstore? What did you ask for? How did you negotiate the fact that your goals were ex existentially threatening to them? Well, we were very lucky that we had some, some advocates like the vice, vice provost. We actually have the person on campus who oversees the bookstore as well. And it, from their perspective, uh, it's really a question of give us this data or we're going to another bookstore. And so the bookstore in order to keep their uh, contract with us uh, gives us those data. You may not be in a similar situation, so you might have to go a different way of identifying who's using OER as ETC, uh, but there's likely a solution, even if it takes some time and some, some careful consideration. I'm gonna pause everybody right here. We are at, at time. So I am gonna go ahead and stop the recording.